I got to tell you, for me, it's a great honor to be here. Got up at 4 o'clock in the morning yesterday, left Los Angeles, flew all the way to Dulles. And as I was coming down 29, I, I was clipping along at about 78, uh, 68 miles an hour. And I thought, this is not right. I mean, it, it seemed like I was getting further and further and further out into the country until finally I came up over the hill and I came into Lynchburg. And I saw this university off to the right-hand side of the road, and I thought, my goodness, Lord, this is, this is like coming into the promised land. You know, I heard a lot of people laugh, but I didn't hear one amen. This is a blessed place. You're a blessed people, and I'm blessed to be here. And I thank you for the opportunity to come and share with you. And I just want to start off by saying that I... Although I'm dressed in a suit right now, normally, if it were one of our crusades, it would probably be Levi's and a leather jacket because we do our open-air crusades on the streets of Latin America. And I come from a crazy family. How many of you come from a crazy family? Raise your hand. Unless, of course, your family members are here, then you don't want to put that hand up. When I was three, my parents were separated. When I was nine, they were divorced. When I was 15, my mom remarried somebody who was 32, 32 years older than she was, and she was his sixth wife. As a matter of fact, he'd been down the center aisle so many times to say, I do, he had permanent rice marks in his forehead. My dad was a bartender, served drinks for 50 years. My mom was an alcoholic. So I do know what it's like to come from a crazy family, from a dysfunctional family. And I can tell you that when I was sitting at Vanguard University, my freshman year, the question that went through my mind is, what in the world am I going to do with my life? In my sophomore year, the question was, what in the world am I going to do with my life? In my junior year, a lot more studies under my belt. The question was, what in the world am I going to do with my life? And after I graduated, the question was, what in the world am I going to do with my life? I've discovered that regardless of your Joel Osteen, the President of the United States, the poorest or the richest person in the world asked that question, what in the world am I doing with my life? And I wrote the book, The Seven Prayers God Always Answers. It came out two days ago. And one of the prayers I'm going to share with you this morning is the first prayer. It's one that God always answers. You can look throughout the Old and New Testament, and no matter where you look, no matter where you search, God always answers, unless you have the heart of Saul, he always answers the prayer for direction. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The Bible says in Exodus 13, 21, it says, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a, power, in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Back in the early 70s, a flight left New York City and was headed to Miami. When they came into the Miami area, they discovered that one of the lights that indicated whether the landing gear was, in, was securely in place or not was not functioning. And so in order to ensure that the landing gear was down, they put it on autopilot and they began to pull apart the navigational system and they couldn't find a solution. So they ripped up the floorboards and the navigational officer went down underneath to look through the little window to verify whether the landing gear was down or not. But what they did not know is that the plane was not on autopilot and it continued to descend and finally when they made their bank over the Everglades, one of the wings clipped the Everglades and killed hundreds of people that day. The pilots forgot to do one thing, the one thing that they were paid to do, which is to fly the airplane. And you know, when I look at Washington today, and I looked at all that is happening, I really asked myself, is anyone flying this airplane? When I look at our economic situation, is anyone really flying this thing? And it's not only true politically, economically, in lots of different areas of life, but you know, when you walk with God, friend, you can rest assured that the greatest pilot in the world has control, and he's sitting behind the wheel, and he will guide you from one end to the other, and he will give you the direction that you need. If you don't walk with God, there are no guarantees. 
If you don't walk with Christ, there are no guarantees. But when you walk with Christ, you have a guarantee that he is going to guide you. And he is going to guide you to the, to the great destiny that he's called you to. Now, the first area that he is going to give you direction in is the direction for financial provision. Now, I say that as a missionary. I say that as, as once a, a starving college student. That God guides people so that the financial provision that they need to function will come. I'll never forget the story that I heard when I was just, I guess it was just a couple of years ago, about this family living in Minneapolis. And it was a family of five. They had a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a baby infant. And they were pastoring this little church at 35. And after probably several weeks, they had to go out and get a job. He was an adjunct professor at a small community college. And his wife came up to him and she said, Honey, I'm sorry, we don't have any food. He said, What do you mean? He said, Well, I don't know what you don't understand about that, but we don't have any food. We don't have any pasta. We don't have any flour. We can't bake. We, can't, we don't have any diapers. We don't have any formula. And unless we get a miracle, we're, we're in serious, we're in serious need right now. He said, Well, let's do this. Let's get and let's make a list of everything that we need, and let's go through the cupboards, and we'll make an inventory of all the things that we need, and after we make that list, we're going to put it down on the table, we're going to pray, and we're going to believe that God is going to provide, because God is the God of provision. And so they did just that. They put everything that they needed, they had 30 some odd items, and they laid it down on the, on the table, and they began to pray. And he said this, Lord, we don't know how we can get these things, and we don't even know how we're going to get the money to buy these things, but we know that you love us. And that you'll provide for us. And so we ask that you will provide for us because we believe that you love us. In Jesus' name. And they hear a knock at the door. So they walk over to the door and they open the door. And there's a deacon standing there. And, and he's, got, he's got bags of food. He says, what are you doing? He says, well, we were just shopping. We were out in the market, and, and we thought, you know, while we're going through the market, we thought, well, you know, pastor might need, my pastor might need some milk, and he might need some, some of this and some of that, and, and so we picked up some formula and some diapers and, and all the things, and we just thought you might need these things. He said, well, why don't you come on in for a cup of coffee? And he said, no, 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 we don't have time. We have perishables in the car. We got to go. We'll see you Sunday. And so they laid the, the bags out on the table. They emptied them out, and they checked off every one of the things that were on that list, including a honey-baked ham. Now, you were probably going to say to me, come on, Jason. I mean, come on. I mean, are you serious? I mean, how do you know that that really happened? Well, those two people had that little baby girl who happens to be my wife. And those people are my in-laws. And they went on to plant churches all throughout Latin America. And I can tell you that God provides every single dime that you need he calls you, he equips you to work, whether it's in Wall Street, to fly airplanes, or to be a missionary. And when he does call you, when he does equip you, he will provide everything that you need along the way. Because he is the God of provision. The second area where you can believe that God is going to direct you is he's the God of open doors. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom... He should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. God is in the business of opening doors. My wife and I, back in the late 90s, we were praying that the Lord would open the door for us to take these evangelistic campaigns from one level to the next. We had 1,500 people showing up every night. We wanted to see 5,000 people showing up every night. And so I said, Lord... We want to make that quantum leap. We want to jump to the next level. And I said, what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to call Channel 7, the most powerful secular television network in Costa Rica, and I want you to tell the owner of the network that you want five commercial spots announcing your crusades for the foreseeable future, 10 days leading up to each event, free of charge. Now, as you can imagine, I thought it was the pizza that I ate the night before. I just couldn't shake it, though. I got up, and I, I began to pace back and forth. I prayed, and I thought, what? five commercial spots, free of charge, the most powerful secular television network in the country, the CNN affiliate? 
So after about 10 days, I finally got up the courage and I called the network headquarters and I said, hi, my name is Jason Friend and we have got an idea for this, for this network and all I need is 15 minutes with the owner of the network. She said, send me a fax. So I sent the fax. 10 days later, the phone rang. She says, you've got 15 minutes with the owner of the network. I said, now what do I do? And the Lord said, you tell him. Tell him we want five commercial spots announcing these crusades for the foreseeable future, 10 days leading up to each event, free of charge. So I got on my nicest suit, called my crusade coordinator. He and I drove to the network headquarters. Once we got to the headquarters, we walked into the lobby and into the elevator, went up to the third floor. It was the most luxurious third floor conference room I had ever seen in my life. When I walked into that conference room, there was a huge oak table with leather wing back chairs and every kind of video format that you can imagine. Oh, it was so impressive. It was like 62 degrees in that room. And it had that, that, that new carpet smell. And I sat down, and my, my, I, I mean, I was ready for a panic attack. Finally, the door opened up, and one after another, the executives of that network came filing through the door, one after another, in their, in their Italian suits. They rounded the outer perimeter of the table and sat down almost in unison. My blood pressure was like 300 over 150. Finally, the door opened up. After 10 minutes, no one said a word. The owner of the network came walking through the door, a 75-year-old woman, and all the ladies said, as soon as she walked in, every man stood at attention. She came in, she sat down right across from me. When she sat down, the rest of us sat down. She looked across the table, she said, now how can I help you, young man? And the Lord said, you tell her. We want five commercial spots announcing these crusades for the foreseeable future, announcing these crusades 10 days leading up to each event free of charge. And I said, you know, that's really easy for you to say. <laughs> I just looked at her and I smiled. <laughs> and I said, you know, we believe that God loves Costa Rica. We believe that in the midst of gang violence and drug addiction and, and all the drug trafficking that's happening in this country, that, that Jesus loves this country and he wants to set these people free by the power of his love. And we need your help in order, to, in order to somehow convey that message of hope to them by guaranteeing us five commercial spots, announcing our crusades for the foreseeable future, 10 days leading up to each event. Free of charge. She said, did you say free of charge? I said, yes, ma'am, free of charge. She said, well, that, that seems reasonable to me. Do any of you men have a problem with that? And all the men said, no, ma'am. <laughs> she said, well, give them whatever they want. She said, is that all you came in here for? Is that all you need? And I said, um, for now. And since that time, the late 90s, we have received five commercial spots announcing our crusades. That door is open for the foreseeable future, 10 days leading up to each event, free of charge. Never had to pay a dime. I got to tell you, when she got up and walked out, I turned to her assistant. I said, can you explain to me what just happened? And the assistant said, you know, Doña Olga, that's her name. She loves the Lord. She's a believer and considers it an honor to get behind what you're doing. You see, friend, God has agents. Agents in strategic places all around the world. And he taps those agents and he says, open a door. And there are thousands of doors that are represented here this morning. Doors in your life. And it's not whether God has the power to open a door. It's whether or not you have the guts to get up and walk through the door. You see, God is not looking for miracle workers. He's looking for door walker throughers. Now, I know that that is not grammatically correct, but that is a coin, that is a term that we're going to coin this morning. He wants you to be a door walker thruer. How many of you are willing to walk through the door if God is going to open it for you this morning? Look through that open door. Look for that open door and decide to walk through it. Third, God will give you direction for impacting others. A friend of mine, a mentor, Zig Ziglar, 
said you can have anything in life you want as long as you're willing to help enough other people get what they want first. And I believe that God will direct you. Just like he directed Philip in Acts 8, 26, as the angel of the Lord said to him, go south to the road, to the desert road that goes down to Jerusalem, to Gaza. He left a, he left a revival. Great things were happening. And he walked up to a chariot with a eunuch in that chariot. He witnessed to him. He got saved. He was baptized. And he went on to transform a nation. God will direct you to impact the lives of people all around the world. One of the first crusades we ever held was in a place called Los Cuadros. It was a marginalized community filled with gang violence, drug addiction, prostitution. We set up our flatbed trailer. We had our lighting systems. We had our speakers. We had all our cables and electricity in place. I left the lot around 3 or 4 in the afternoon, went home, had a bite to eat, 11 o'clock, I was in bed. 11.30, the phone rings. It was the wife of the pastor who was hosting the event. She said, Brother Jason? I said, yes. She said, do you remember your sound system? I said, yes. She said, do you remember the lighting? I said, yes. She said, do you remember all the electrical cables, flatbed trailer? I said, uh-huh. She said, do you remember the 10 guards that we left in place to make sure that all that stuff would be safe? I said, yes. She said, they're not there. I said, why aren't they there? She said, a gang showed up, a gang of 25, and they cut off one of the guards' ears, and he's in intensive care right now, and there's no one. The rest of the guards just fled to save their lives. There's no one there, no one else there. And we recommend that if you want to have anything left by daybreak, that you get on up here and that you, you guard our, our sound, uh, your sound gear and all your platform and lighting and so forth. I mean, my husband, he's frantic. He's out there looking for anyone, anyone to replace those guards. He's out there looking with anyone with a gun, a dog, a mean cat. He'll take anything he can get. Right now, we're desperate. We need you to get on up here. I said, that's fine. So I, I put on my Nike uh, shirt, just do it. Yeah. Had my Nike running shorts, my Nike running shoes, my Nike socks. I looked like the Nike poster boy. And I got into my minivan and drove up to Los Cuadros. And I got, now I don't wake up quickly. Obviously, I wouldn't have dressed like that had I, did, had I woke up quickly, but I don't. So I got out of the minivan, I started to pace back and forth, and uh, I noticed a sign that's behind the platform that says, I esperanza en Jesus, which means there is hope in Jesus. And I thought, Lord, that is the, that's the message that we want to proclaim here in Los Cuadros, that there's hope in the midst of prostitution and gang violence. Help us, Lord, with that message. And I'm looking at that, and all of a sudden I hear a noise behind me, and all of a sudden when I turn around, there are 25 gang members standing in a half-moon circle off of that platform. And the leader emerges, and he walks right up to the foot of the, of the platform, and he says, what do you think you're doing here? And I said, um, I'm guarding the platform. <laughs> he said, who's this guy? Jason Friend. Who's this evangelist? Jason Friend. I said, um, I don't know. <laughs> now, I eventually told him who I was, but I was trying to buy as much time as I could. And I said, you know, my name is Jason Friend. He said, that's impossible. I said, no, my name is Jason Friend. No, that's impossible. All preachers are short, bald, and fat. <laughs> I said, no, my, my, name is J my name is Jason Friend. And that, I hear this, this, the sound of a honking, a honking vehicle. Is, and, and, and I look over to the right, and... Onto the lot drives a pastor. He's got 10 new guards, and he's got two Doberman pinchers. Now, if there's one thing that Latins do not like, that's mean dogs, okay? And when those two Doberman pinchers got out of that, 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 that group, that gang would say, you know what, I think we're done here for the night. And I looked at my watch and said, oh, I've been relieved of my post. I'll see you later. And I went to get my minivan, but the leader shouted from across the lot. He said, we'll see you tomorrow night. And they came the first night, but they did not come to worship the Lord. No, during the first song, I noticed huge concrete rocks that were being hurled in from behind the sound booth and exploding on top of our aluminum platform. During the second song, there was a guy 10 feet off to the left-hand side who was trying to sell an undercover cop cocaine. And that undercover cop 
took out his nunchucks and beat that guy into the ground and threw him into the back of the squad car. During the third song, one kid from an enemy gang pulled out a crowbar and struck another, ki another enemy uh, gang member from the other uh, gang in the forehead, split his skull almost into blood everywhere, and a huge brawl breaks out. And I thought to myself, this is the most holy roller service I've ever been in in my life. I walked over to call the police from the payphone. I said, we need your help. We're in the middle of this event. We need you to come out. We'll be right there. Where are you at? I said, Los Cuadros. They said, we'll be there tomorrow. While I was preaching, the band, I'm sorry, the gang was rocking the bus, and the bus was bumping up against the platform, and we had taken a youth team from Lancaster, California, and had to enclose them with a padlock in that bus for their security. It was like preaching during an earthquake. At that, five guys walked onto that lot. They made an entrance like no one I had ever seen before in my life. First time I'd ever seen pastors and security guys moving out of their way to let these five gang members walk onto that lot. They were the most feared drug trafficking, organized crime leaders in that region. They had heard about that kid with the crowbar, and they were coming to settle the score. And when they walked across that lot, they planted themselves at the base of a light tower. And as I began to preach, the first words out of my mouth were, some of you will be going to hell unless Jesus intervenes in your life. You need to give your life to Christ. You need to start your life all over again. But unless you do that, this could be your last opportunity. The leader froze. He turned to his associate. He said, what that guy just say up there? And the guy said, you mean that gringo that's up there screeching on the platform? He says, yeah, what did he just say? He said, we were all going to hell and there was nothing we could do about it. That's what I thought he said. That's exactly what he said. And he not only said all of us, he especially pointed to us five here at the base of the light tower. And the leader turns to his associate and he says, well, okay, well, we'll see who's going to hell after this service is over. And they stopped looking for that kid with the crowbar. And they started focusing on me. And I knew it. So I made my message as concise and as precise as I possibly could. I was preaching to five guys. Not intentionally, but that's just the way it turned out. I said, you know, it doesn't matter if you're into drugs, Jesus can set you free. It doesn't matter if you're a gang member and into drugs, Jesus can set you free. As a matter of fact, it doesn't matter if you're into organized crime, a gang member into drugs, Jesus can set you free. I gave that altar call. And 17 people came forward. I look over to the left-hand side, and my wife, she's huddled together with our daughters, and she's saying, oh, oh, God, please don't let him kill my husband. I look over in the band. You know, they're over there huddled together. They're praying, oh, God, please don't let him kill Jason. And I look over at the Lancaster youth team. They're peeking through the windows of the bus. You know, they're, they're oh, God, please don't kill Jason. We need him to take us to the airport tomorrow. And what's the man of God doing? Man with the word of God, the man of fire, what, is, what, what am I doing? I'm praying, oh God, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. <laughs> An usher stands. He was on his knees praying at that altar, praying, interceding for people. He stood, walked to the base of that light tower. His name is Victor. To this day, I'll never forget that walk. He planted himself at the base of that light tower, looked those five guys in the eye, and he said, you know, he said, my brother is dying from the drugs that you guys have brought into this community. And if you had any sense whatsoever, you'd give your heart to Jesus, and he'd set you free. You guys do what you do because you want freedom, but all you're doing is you're bearing yourself further and further into, into, in, into chains and bondage. If you had any sense whatsoever, you'd listen to what this guy is saying, and you'd leave this place free, truly free. He says, I feel the need to pray for you, to pray for our community. I'm going to pray right now. Do you have a problem with that? They said no. And he began to pray, and he prayed like Hispanics pray. Now, I don't know if you've ever been around a Hispanic when they pray, but when they pray, I mean they pray. <laughs> and he said, oh, God, send your fire. 
And they began to look around for this fire that was going to fall. Oh, God, renew this community. Do something dynamic tonight. Set us free. And after praying five minutes, he stops. He looks at me and says, you know, I just believe that if we accept Jesus, if we accept Jesus into our heart tonight, right now, we'll leave this place completely set free. And I saw from a well-protected spot on this platform, looking out, a miracle of miracles taking place as five gang members began to remove their hats and begin to get on their knees and ask Jesus into their hearts with their hands in the air. I mean, they got saved. They got saved. And they walked down to the front. They walked down to the front and they were crying. They said, oh, Brother Jason, we just want to ask you for forgiveness because we were going to kill you afterwards, but... <laughs> You don't have to worry about that now. And I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Five days afterward, the phone rang. 11 o'clock at night. I don't know why everybody keeps calling me at 11 o'clock at night. He said, is this Brother Jason? I said, yes. He said, this is Brother Jason? I said, yes. He said, this is John. You remember me? I was going to kill you after the service. I said, I will never forget you for the rest of my life. He said, I just got out of an all-night prayer meeting. I just want to tell you that, that Jesus has set us free. We're walking in freedom. Hang on a second. Carlos wants to say hi to you. Carlos gets on the phone. Do you remember me? I said, I'll never forget you either. <laughs> he said, God is so good. God is so good. He's changing our lives. Hang on a second. Andre wants to talk to you. Talk to all five of those gang members. And the topic of the, com topic of the conversation is, God is so good. He's changing our lives. Andre came to work full-time for us. He began to tour all of Central America. And the ironic thing was, is his duty was to polish and clean the same platform that he was throwing rocks at earlier. You know, God has the ability to change lives and impact people. And Andre today received an email from him just a couple of months ago. Life hasn't been peachy. It hasn't been great. He's married. He's got two daughters. He's leading worship in a local church. All five of those gang members... They left that gang. They began to recruit their other gang members. Churches began to explode, and the grand gang activity in Los Cuadros has never been the same because Jesus is in the business of transforming people's lives. And finally, God is going to give you direction for the single most important decision of your life. He will give you that direction that you need. Like I said to you before, I come from a crazy family. There's lots of alcoholism, Lots of delinquency, lots of problems. And a Hispanic family invited me to church. It was one of these Spanish-speaking families, or I should say a Hispanic family that doesn't really speak Spanish anymore. They're a third-generation Hispanic family. And these folks were front-row Christians. Do you know what I mean by front-row Christians? I mean, they're always sitting in the front row. And they carried a Bible that was big enough to be considered a concealed weapon. And they invited me to church. His dad, he's a PK, his dad was a Baptist preacher. Invited me to church. I had never been to an evangelical church before. My dad was a bartender and he used to always say, if I ever walked into an evangelical church, the building will collapse. As a joke, he would say that all the time. And so I had this fear that the building was going to collapse. So when I walked into the building... They sat down in the front row, and as soon as my backside hit the pew, a blackout, I'm not kidding you, a blackout took three blocks of electricity with it, and, and all the electricity in that church was gone. I thought, man, alive, my dad's a prophet. <laughs> Pastor called for the ushers to light candles. And you know, you're, if you're going to invite somebody to church, we all know what the unspoken rule is. The unspoken rule is you're supposed to make your friend feel comfortable in church. But you know what this wonderful friend of mine said to me when the blackout hit? He said, you know, that's never happened in the history of this church until you walk through the door. <laughs> Pastor called for the ushers to light these candles. Light snowing, light snow falling outside, 28 degree weather, Big Bear Lake, California. The pastor began to share a Bible verse that's found in 
John 8:36. It says, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Yet to all who received him, John 1, 12, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. You know, friend, you could look at my family history. And you would see a tremendous amount of pain between my great-grandmother, my grandmother, and my mother. You'd see cycle after cycle of depression, of alienation, of addiction. And yet every generation said, you know, when I grow up, and when I get older, I'm not going to do what was done to me. No, I'm going to do things differently, only to discover that they do the same things that they swore they would never do or become the same people that they swore they would never become. And yet that night, when I chose to open my heart, give my life to Jesus, he directed my path to the most important decision of my life. And I can tell you that 30 years later, that Jesus has indeed broken the cycles of generational dysfunction because the man standing before you is not an alcoholic. I am not divorced. And I can tell you I'm not addicted to alcohol or drugs, not because I'm some great person, but because the power of God is real and Jesus comes to set the captive free. Perhaps you're sitting in your seat this morning. You say, you know, you have no idea what I'm dealing with. That's true. But you know God does. You have no idea the frustration that I'm going through. It's true. But God does. You have no idea how frustrated I feel. That's true. But God does. And I can tell you that God loves you. He considers you the apple of his eye. And he desires to give you the direction that you desire this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your love. I thank you for this student body who so impresses me this morning that what motivated me, Lord, to get up on that, get up at 4 a.m. and fly all the way across the country was to tell this student body that God has it all under control. That he is the God who provides direction in the midst of the storm. So I pray, Lord, at this moment, for anyone who feels lost, anyone who needs to be found, anyone who needs direction in their life, confirmation of the call that you've given them, anyone, Lord, who desperately needs to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are making the way, providing a solution, I ask in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would, that you would somehow defend every attack of the enemy, that every fiery dart, every thought that goes through the mind would be rebuked by the authority of the name of Jesus, Lord. I pray that you would do that. And this morning I pray that each and every student would have the mind of Christ, the ability to hear your voice, to understand your direction. And I ask, Lord, that you would do the miracle of miracles this morning. And I'm going to ask my friend here this morning, if you feel that there has been a chasm between you and God, perhaps over a cup of coffee you would say, you know, my life is not going that well. There's a tremendous distance and I need to reconnect my life with Christ this morning. Whether it's for the very first time or you just simply say, I just need my paths to be redirected because I feel like I mean, I don't even know where I'm going. But I need God in my life, and I need the Spirit of God to guide me. I want to reconnect my life with Him this morning. I'm not going to ask you to come down here to the front, but I do want to pray for you. I'm just going to ask you to slip up your hand, if that's you this morning. Would you slip up your hand at this moment? Father, I thank you for these who have raised their hands. And I pray, Lord, that you would guide their steps. I pray, Lord, for those who need to begin that relationship with Christ, that you would not only allow them to experience your love and your grace, but, Lord, I pray in Jesus' mighty name that you would provide for them everything that is necessary to walk, to walk with you, to follow you, the, dis the, the, the discipline to follow you, and the strength. I ask in Jesus' mighty name, Lord, that you would guide their steps and give them divine direction. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And I close with this final phrase. This is something that God prompted in my heart to write to you personally. You are here at this university. 
You are called of God. He has given you a divine direction to impact this world for such a time as this. May God continue to bless you richly. Thank you so much.